ATPI, delivering what really matters. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us for another episode of the Speed Freaks chat show with myself, Scott Nichols, and the verbal wonder from down under, Charlesy, all brought to you by ATPI Travel. So then, Charlesy, who we got on the show tonight? Well, Scotty, too hotty Nichols, we have a Speedway legend, the 1993 individual Speedway champion of the world, Sutton, Sam Ermalenko. Hey, hey, Sam, thanks for joining us. What an introduction. Thanks for that. Yeah, nice to be here. I can't wait to get, participate in your wild stats, whatever's happening. <laughs> There's no stats in this show. The stats come from you, Sam, right. from way back when. So, uh, yeah, as with the show, we always start off from when you popped on the planet, basically. So uh, tell us what little Sam was into as a kid and, and how you got into the racing and everything. Well, I, I grew up in a pretty conventional American neighborhood, I guess, um, not far from the beach, a bus ride from the beach. Um, we had stingrays, motor bicycles. Uh, we had a hill on our road, so and our driveway was steep. So I was always on a bike, always figuring things out on a bicycle and stuff like that. Um, pretty good neighborhood. A lot of um, pe- people my age, my kids my age, I grew up with. The school was only she had probably 15 houses down the road and um that was good it was it was pretty pretty much pretty cool place to grow up really so did you go was there a transition to speedway was that what you started in or were you into like motocross and stuff before speedway yeah um the, the way the, the way the motorcycles got into the irma Linkle family was yeah i decided to get a business when i was about 11 o'clock and they started a motorcycle business i don't know why. 11 years old I don't know why I said that, but um, I thought it was an American thing. We'll let you off. Yeah, well, I probably looked at the big clock right there. So. <laughs> Good job, we said clock. Yeah, and uh, so my dad and my mom's boss from that Rockwell, uh, they hooked up and uh, started a business, and that business um, was motorcycle engineering and stuff. And that was when I was 10, 11 years old. Okay, that's that's what got my dad into it, which I got dragged along because I was a, a I was a young wanted to get on a bike, and my dad really didn't know much about that stuff. But my dad's partner now, Bill, he was right into bikes. So he had four kids that were all boys, and they rode motorcycles, and I got tagged along, and that's kind of how we started. Probably 12, 13 years old, I started riding out in the desert. And a speedway didn't even come into my life until I was right almost 20 years old. Wow. So with that, Sam, was there ever a hint of you playing cricket or baseball or American football or, you know, why, why the speed factor? Was it something that made you excited or was there another sport in your life? This, this, is, this is good because, I mean, there's some, um, you know, every family's got their problems in life, don't they? Moms and dads and stuff. And mom and dad um, broke up when I was 13. Right. I was, I was the man of the house. I had an older sister and a younger brother and a sister between me and my brother. So um, it was when I was 13 years old, I had to kind of kind of hold the fort for my mom and help her out and stuff. And uh, we, we had, it was pretty crazy. My dad had lots of motorcycle stuff around the house, but he wasn't there. Right. Um, and I got a chance to build, build kind of contraptions of motorcycles. And we had a field, shoot, probably a, a not even a half a mile away, a mile away. That was a cow field where there was cows in there and stuff. Well, we, we as a group of kids, we would get mini bikes, bikes, whatever we can. And, and the rule was we had to push our bikes to the field to ride them. We can ride if we want to. And I can remember this is how, back, how, how far back that was. Gasoline was 25 cents a gallon. Ooh, that's Jeez. expensive. So, wow. so I, used to, I used to get, if I was good, I'd get 50 cents to go out, and leave the house, and leave my mom alone. And that would buy me an RC Cola a chocolate bar and a gallon of gas. And that's what I do for the whole day. That was a life, wasn't it? 
sadly in your career you had a lot of nasty injuries obviously you know the leg injuries which were well for most people would have been career ending so um how do you overcome that i mean you're a rider that i looked up to I, I admired you as a kid you were one of my favorite riders and so how did you mentally overcome something like that yeah well um right okay that's that was pretty probably easy if you think between me racing and those kind of incidents about almost in the, in the lives as me being a part of that. When I was 16 years old, I got my driver's license, didn't I? And I was on a road bike. And because my dad had the bike shop, I was able to um, have bikes and stuff like that. Well, I was not relying on a bike for transportation, but I happened to be repairing a friend's motorbike and I took it to the workshops my dad has and worked on it after hours because I had a job there when I was 16. And uh, unfortunately for me, a car and I in an intersection had a big collision and that was uh, life threatening at 16 years old. I was broken up. I swear, that's why I have the big boot on the right leg and that's what crushed my leg. Oh, wow. And all that happened when I was 16. So I was in and out of hospital right up until I was 19. Jeez. See, for, for me, Sam, I, got my, I got my bike at 19 and a half, my speedway bike. For, for me, that, that just dispels one of the greatest myths that I, I, I've ever heard because you, you burst onto to sort of my radar and an Australian speedway um, with the TAP series, although you'd already been world champion. But the first, first time that you come to Australia with the TAP series and you had um Morgan Hughes uh on your team and and Dookie was there and Rick Hartz and, and all the other big boys and and there's Sam Ermalenko and, and I'll tell you I don't know if you ever heard this but the myth was and it was really good because I was a young Australian um very much into Miss Speedway and it was all about Sam Ermalenko and his custom-made Reeboks <laughs> there you go yeah and it was it was such a big a big myth about how how the leg injury come and that's the first actually the first time I've heard the truth about it. Yeah, yeah. So so back to the determination was um, I had a bit of a taste at riding motocross before that accident at sixteen. Um, obviously, mom and dad were still working out their differences when they got divorced and stuff. And my mom was always like, "Your dad needs to take." pay more attention to you you need to be doing things and blah blah so my dad ended up buying me a motocross bike i had a, a 1974 yz 125 you know it was like two or three years old but it was still a trick and i got to go riding with my dad's partner's kids and we'd go racing so we rode it was like five or six motocross tracks within 40 minutes of where we lived so we can just go pick a track on any weekend and go riding well i did that and um it was after that when I was getting really good at racing the motocross, getting through the, the beginners, the novices, and then getting the intermediate class, and then there was pro, and you did different classes for different tracks when you're riding, but I got pretty good. And some of the guys that I was racing with were like Brian Myerscoff, Jeff Ward, and those kind of guys were my era. And I was on their tail. They were probably 30 minutes faster than me at, in a 40 minute race, but I was still getting second or third to them. But that was pretty good, only my second year of racing motocross. Wow. And then that's when the accident happened on the road. So it put me way back. And then because my ambition was I wanted to ride motocross, I wanted to do the Golden State Series. I actually did the Golden State Series after that accident I had when I was 16 because I had, I wanted to still ride if I could. So I did like a year and a half of rehabilitation. And the doctors told me back then, man, you're never going to do anything. You should give up that. Your leg's pretty messed up. And because they told me that when they were bedside in the hospital, what's one kid going to do at 16? He's going to focus on proving them wrong, isn't he? That's, I think that's where my determination came from. Safe to say you did that. <laughs> yeah. So, so you started Speedway real late then, but you were only a young pup when you come to the UK. So how did you go from – how did you get so good at Speedway so quick, pretty much? So, um, I, I, I look back – where I, where I kind of recognized I must have had something that was different than I don't even know how I learned it either, to be fair, because in, maybe the short leg helped you out a little bit. But it actually got in my way. <laughs> Believe it or not, my left leg, I was tearing up boots and 
knees and stuff like that because I had to keep bending my left leg all the time. You know, with the, with the right leg, you can keep yourself balanced on the bike. Yeah. But the left leg got in my way all the time when I was riding. I, as when I really was focusing on my fine tuning my 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 deal whenever I was quite good at it, I was like my legs. That's why I was trying different foot plank links on the right hand side of my bike a lot. Right. Left leg off the ground a bit more. But um, what the story is this? Um, I got into the speedway at the end of the 1981 season in America. Because what happens there is uh, you have to get you have to enroll and get a license, pay for the, pay the AMA, National Federation the AMA, get a license, and it was professional then it wasn't amateur. And then you would um, in order to to ride at the tracks you would have to do a rider's test. And what that meant was you have to get on your bike, go around the track, and there'd be four corner men with red flags, and there'd be a referee standing in the middle of the track watching you guys watching you ride. And at any one time. He's going to nod to one of the flags, throw the flag, and you have to dump the bike. And you have to stall the bike right then and there. We had to do that in Australia, Sam. Is that right? There you go. And I think they should do it here because that, to me, is obviously we need to ride bikes. But if there's an accident, I mean, I did it as a kid. When the train show I went to, that was one of the things they did as well. You had to know how to lay the bike down. No one ever does it now. Well, you know, the reasons why, because they stopped doing it in, in the California, because you're, you're, you're actually asking a rider to hurt himself, right? So they're reliable. If that rider went down and hurt himself. Yeah. A control, a controlled crash. And, and a speedway we've seen over the years, Sam, some of the, the speedway accidents that don't look big turned out to be the, the, the damaging ones. Yeah. So with that, with, with saying that now, I enrolled, I, I entered, I went to a racetrack, Ventura Raceway is what it was, down by the beach in Ventura. Um, we went there and um, I had to do my rider's test there. And then what, you, what happens in California is, is when you, when you want to race in the race the next week, you have to sign up on a rider's list. And on that rider's list, they'll, they'll see, they'll build the program for the next week and they'll look if you qualify for the fight of the main events in the night, you're automatically in the program the next week. But if you didn't qualify for the main, so let's say there's, I think there was two sets of main, so it's probably eight to 10 riders would be on the program the next week. The rest of them were the guys that signed up the week before and they would fill the program that way. So sometimes you have to wait two to three weeks before your name came up to be on the program. But the idea was to stay on the program or making the main event and do it safely. And you would be on the next week. Well, Ventura was one of those tracks that were was off the beaten track where a lot of the big boys or the riders that would ride regularly wouldn't go. So I went there, did my rider's test, signed up that week. The first rider's test I did, I failed. But I signed up for the next week. The next week, I rescheduled my rider's test. When I showed up, I was on the program. And I had to do my rider's test first. It was kind of unique. So no pressure. Yeah, so I went out there, passed my rider. The reason I, I failed the first one was the flag came up, and I said, okay, and I put the bike down nice and easy and put it down, but then I kept the bike running, and he went, nope. And I go, why? He goes, because the bike's still running. I went, oh, I didn't know I had to kill the bike. So the next time I went here, he put the bike down and made sure it stalled, and I passed. And then the very first race I was in, I won in that night. No way. Yeah, so that was that. Well, that was 81, and then here's, here's, here's where it all changed. In 1982, I started the season now with the license and was able to ride all the available tracks, which I think it was probably three to four nights a week you could ride. You could ride on a Tuesday, a Wednesday, and a Friday at that time. And then in 1982, do you remember what happened in 1982 in L.A. Coliseum? Bruce Penno. You got it. So you see Brucey. So what happened was all of the European fans and promoters were in L.A. during the 82 season. So what happened was Brian Maidman from Pool Speedway obviously scouted out the tracks when he was there, and he noted my name in 1982, so it was my first full season of racing. And so he noted me, he probably seen something in my ability on the tracks that maybe nobody else, I don't know, it doesn't matter, but he was European, right? And then, and so at the end of the 82 season, I, I finished it. And then 83, I started in America on the season again. So it was my second season now. By, by I think it was September time, our season went to 
end of October or middle of October, I got a phone call from, from England and it was Brian Maidman from Pool Speedway looking to fill the spot that they had vacant and he wanted an American in that spot. So here I was, no experience. What I didn't even know freaking what the European Speedway or Australian Speedway was. I was focused. I had a, I had a VW and Porsche repair shop. I, had, I was married with two kids and I was sitting in my workshop and the phone rang in my workshop. I answered it, said, hello. And he says, hello, this is Brian Maidman. Anyway, is this Sam Romalenko? And I said, uh, yeah, who's this? Brian Maidman from Pool Speedway. Sam Romalenko, do you, I would like to talk to you about racing. Do you have a manager? And I'm going, manager? <laughs> what? And I went, so, so what are you on about? What do you want? He goes, I want to know if you want to ride in British Speedway. And I'm thinking, well, tell me a little bit about it. So he told me what goes on. And I said, you know what? I don't know a lot about what you're saying, but if you call me back tomorrow at such and such time, I'll be with somebody and we can talk about it. Boom. So wow. I was in less than my, my second year, not even finished second year speedway. And I'm getting an invitation to come to ride for pool. Okay. Well, this kind of may answer it in a way, but it's really interesting. So where did the name Sudden Sam come from, or is it just because it only took two years? Because your name's actually, your first name's actually Sam, is it? I never knew that for a long time. Right. Well, where that came from. Now, that track I just mentioned to you about Ventura Speedway, it's actually a, a small um, sprint car track. There was a journalist at, at Ventura named Bill Losey. Cool dude. Really cool dude. His presents were really well known when he came in. He had a bit of a beard, kind of long hair, big guy, and he came up. And he was just enthusiastic about Speedway. And whenever I went there, started, because he, he seen me do my writer's test. The story I just told you, he's seen all that. And he also seen me win my first race. So he actually made a little story, a little thing about that back then, saying, hey, how'd that happen? This guy just did his writer's test and went out and won his first race. And then he interviewed me about that first race win. You only just got your license. I said, yeah. So he was following me. And I was, I was getting quite good in the handicap racing because it was a big track. I would lay back and wait for all the guys because there were six guys in the race, different yard lines. And I was second division at this time. So we can go 30 yards back. And I would wait for the guys to kind of huddle up and stay in their lines because a lot of guys just wanted to ride the pole. They didn't want to venture out to high lines and stuff. But I was quite good on the big, on the big line. And I just wait. And then when they bundled up, I just shoot from the outside and I just, just like that. So he, he interviewed me in the pits. I remember him doing it, and he said something, and I said, I just wait, and then I'd go for it, man. I just knew what I was doing, and somehow another sudden came up in the thing. And I said, yeah, I'd go for it. I'd suddenly just hit the throttle, and I'd go. And he big headlines was Sudden Sam. And <laughs> it stayed with me from that day on. Uh, yeah, but your first name's not Sam, though, is it? <laughs> That's no <most> story. He <laughs> said, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do have to go to bed at some point, mate. No, it's like, yeah, no, so see, where did oh, so because goes. sudden Sam? But like I said, your name, not many people know that unless you don't want people to know it, but it's your name's not Sam, is it? No, what it is, is my, my real name is Guy Allen. Um, and um, when my, when my father and my mother, um, I was born, my father had a business in, in, in LA, in Maywood, California, around that area. I was born in Maywood. And um, when I came back, he had a he had a high street store. He was a TV repairman, radio TV repairman back in those days. And I was brought into the shop in my little basket thing or whatever. And his partner then was a guy named John Snyder, which was a lovely guy, man. I remember this guy, his best friend as I was growing up. He, um, I came in and they said, you know, they introduced me to him as Guy Allen or Malinko. And he looked at it, he probably just shook his head. What the hell is the name Guy? You know, he's looked at that thing. And then when people come in, he goes, you know what? And somebody else came in going, oh, how cute is this baby? Or whatever they would say. I'm a baby, right? And all of a sudden he said, yeah, what's his name? He'd say, Sam. <laughs> and it stuck. Since I was born, I've been Sam. And I was Christian. I was baptized as Samuel. But my name's Guy. Ah, okay. So, okay, right. So we know then clearly that... Uh, you're a talented guy and obviously pick up things very, very quick. So a man of your motorcycle expertise and you do all the tuning and everything else, 
there must be another talent there somewhere. What do you reckon, Charlesy? Oh, there's there's got to be. It, I don't think it's a dancer, um, as we've seen uh, last last week, but um, he's got something about him, Sam. What have you got for us, Sam? You, what's your hidden talent? No, my hidden talent. Well, I don't think I really I'm talented at anything really, but I love playing my guitar and I love playing drums and I love doing musical stuff. But I I, I think I'm musical death to be fair. But so what do I do now? I reckon you're gonna get something out and strum it, and hopefully it's a guitar and not something let's, else. Let's see it. Let's see it. Well, I got a guitar in my room. I, I just got it too. Go on, man. Go grab it. <laughs> I didn't see that coming. I reckon I reckon him and Boise and Rod Calhoun, I reckon they they must have had a jam together. Oh, I bet. You reckon? We were in a band one time, all, through, all of us guys. There you go. Bo- Boise was our leader in the band. Yeah, well, he's, um, he, he's going pretty hard now with Rocket Rod Calhoun, Sam. I know that. And Rod, I think Rod is the, is he the bass player. Yes, yes. He would be, he would be. Huh? And, and the singer, he's the vocalist, isn't he? Is that right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sweet ass. I know that because I talk to Lengo all the time and uh, he's always telling me stuff. I mean, this, this guitar's got history. I actually made a mistake in the ice one time and this was at, over Christmas time and this guitar was in the back of my car and this guitar did a couple of endos in my car with me. <laughs> oh, you're going to serenade us now, are you, Sam? No, I, I don't play. You know one thing everybody... <laughs> Going to, Come on, Scotty, let's give me a lighter me. out. <laughs> when you go, when you go, when you go into a guitar store, you know there's one song that nobody's allowed to play. You know, go it? on, Sam. We, we, we're gonna, it's gonna happen now. Hang I on, let me do the gang. This, I haven't picked this guitar up. <laughs> Who's on a Coldplay concert? And then I mess around with it. That's all I do. Is- <laughs> ah, there you go. Bro, you got you got something there. Anyway, that's it. There you go. That's not a right, bad talent. Right. That's, that's it. Bad I could beat the drums, but then I'd wake my cat up, and my cat's quietly sleeping. We well, don't want to wake the cat up. That's for sure. That's for sure. Wow. So just before we move on to more modern stuff, going back to Speedway, I never realized Speedway was as big as it was, like you were saying. Um, why do you think Speedway is not as popular in America anymore? And, and do you look back on it and kind of is it a little bit sad for you to see how many tracks don't run anymore back in the States? Um, uh, I'll tell you what, the, the reason why, I think I can see this thing's a little bit off. The reason why... Speedway had its um, its its little bit of um, time and was quite popular. It's only popular in Southern California. There's three something million people, and it was only popular in a little pocket of Southern California. And it was down to Ivan Major, Brigo, Barry Briggs, and um, Mr. Harry Oxley, and th- those were the guys. Jack Milling was a 1937 world champion. Um, I was fortunate enough to um, to know him. Um, had a picture with me, him and Bruce, which was, was pretty. It's pretty amazing uh, photograph with all three of us. But um, Jack, Jack was the one that kind of funded, I believe, funded Harry Oxley and um, Ivan Major and, and Barry Briggs's kind of mo- motions to to run Speedway in California. So it became quite popular. But the rest of the United States, with that many people, I mean, the United States is very commercialized. And it takes a lot of money to tell everybody about Speedway. Yeah. Being in a, being a very condensed area like Southern California, where I grew up and where it was popular, it soon outpriced itself to be able to tell the public. You know, the gap between the social media we have now and the times when the radio shows were demanding huge money to get advertisements or even... You could never even think about getting on a TV commercial, not there because the price tag was way too high. So it was never going to be that big. Now you might you might give an example of like Supercross. 
that was big. That became very big quite quick because it's manufactured behind a lot of money. And just about everybody knows the brand of Yamaha, Honda, Suzuki, and Kawasaki. So it's quite easy for those kind of promoters to go fill a 60,000 seated stadium with motocross event. But Speedway, to tell everybody, I tell you what, if there's a Supercross going on in Anaheim, California, every rock and roll radio station, even country station, even every station's got an advert. What's going to happen? Supercross coming to Anaheim Stadium, blah, blah, blah. It's on, it's, they're cramming it down you. Speedway, hell. The only way Speedway ever got any publicity on the radios in the modern time of the pricing was if they had Harley night and they had Harley behind it, and then Harley would add that to their adverts and say, you know, Harley Davidson night at Costa Mesa Speedway, then you get a big crowd. That's, that's the Harley thing. That's big business, though, still in, in the States, you know, the Springfield Mile and, and things like that. That, that flat track scene, Sam, um, is, is still big in the sport. And I guess it, it, it's at the forefront of oval racing in some sort of spectrum. Absolutely, but not, not in the West, not in coast, not in California. Right. Half mile in, in, in Sacramento. That, that one's kind of been a legendary thing for, the, for that. But usually it's a mid, it's a mid East sport because that's where all the sprint car tracks would you be familiar yeah with? all the sprint car tracks are there so what they do is they just use those tracks and ama would sanction it american motorcycle would, would sanction it and they put some money behind it and that's why but then again in the flat track side of things harley honda they're all they're all kind of into that yeah, even ktm now um i know that they're, they're back in one of the young female races uh, on, the, on the single 450s i think she rides I mean, um, Indian Indians made it come back, didn't he, in the flat track right now? So it's just crazy what's going on. Yeah, yeah. So, so you came over the states early doors um, when Speedway was still huge in America. Like you said, exceptionally young guy, married, two young children. Come to UK was probably a massive contrast. What were your kind of first thoughts for the differences when you hit the UK, apart from the weather? Um, you know, I never, I never. Um, I never really knocked the weather, even though I was from Southern California, whenever I was um, came over here, because what an adventure. I mean, um, you know, the pool speedway, when I finally negotiated that, that's another story there. I probably don't have time for that, but there was an Australian. Now, I when I was racing in the local tracks in America, I was I thought I was pretty good. And there was a couple of, that we have three divisions, right? There's a third, second, and first division. When you hit first division, you start off in handicaps. And when you get to the 30-yard line marker and back, you're eligible to ride in the scratch racing, which is what we do here all in the line. So, man, going up the ranks, first or third division, you get through that. You have to win two main events from the from the zero to the 10-yard line in third division. And then you have to do the 10-yard twice. And then you're eligible to go into the second division. Then you do second division from the zero to 10 the 20 and the 30 and you have to win from each one of them to go back. And then you get to the back and you have to be in the back and be winning fairly regular to get a chance to ride in the first division on the zero yard line. And that's how it went. And then when you got in the 30, you're, you're, you made it because now you're one of the big boys racing in the scratch racing. Now that kind of, um, that kind of way of doing it really taught you how to ride the motorbike a lot. And then, it wasn't until shoot when I was starting to win the on the big big boy on the on, in the first division is when you start making money too. That's where they pay you, but the other ones it's just a trophy. So I started earning pretty good money racing in um, in the in the first division, and then the phone call for me to come over to Europe um, was like I said in September of that year in 80, 83. Um, I had to I had to give up my business. I had a partner. So me and my partner talked about it. My partner says, I'll run the business for six weeks while you're gone. But I also had a state championship and also a national championship in that term of six weeks that Brian made me from Pool Speedway wanted me to come over. So I'm thinking, I can't give up those. That's my titles. I want to chase those titles. So I had to think of who's going to be my manager to talk to this guy. So I called up this Australian guy that was giving getting sponsors for the guys that were way worse than I was in Speedway, and I'd go up to them, they're all glittered with nice badges on their leathers, and I'd see Paul Hefferman hanging around him, and I'd go, Paul, 
how come you give him spawn, get him sponsors, but I'm kicking his butt. And he just looked at me and say, well, that's just the way it is. You know, you got to be good. And I'm thinking I am better than those guys. I want something. I want some product or something. Couldn't get, I got SGP sponsored one time. That was my goal. And then I got cow guard and I'm thinking, all right, I'm getting there. Well, it was Hefferman that got me the cow guard one at the end. So he just wore me thin and said, you just got to do good. He just wanted to be that guy in the pits that you'd come to as a writer and ass. And then I thought, well, this guy, he was Australian. And I thought he was English because he had an accent. I didn't know. So when Brian was talking to me on the phone saying, do you have a manager? The only person I can think of is this Paul guy. <laughs> right? So I, I called up Paul and I said, hey, Paul, you're going to love this story too. <laughs> I go, Paul, this British guy has called me up. What do I do? And he goes, right. Well, what do you want to do? And I says, I don't know. And he goes, he wants to know how much money I want to come over there. And he goes, well, what do you want? And I said, I don't know. What, how's it work? And he goes, well, you're going to have to come see me and I'll tell you all about it. I said, all right, I'll do that. So I said, what do we do? And he goes, well, come over after work. I said, okay. And he said, bring some donuts with you. That was the word. When you come over tonight, bring some donuts and we'll have a coffee and we'll talk about it. I said, okay. Me and Paul are in his house now, him the donut and the coffee. I told him what just happened, whatever. And he goes, right, so what do you want to do? And I said, you know what? They can't, they won't be able to afford me, man. I'm, I need to earn X amount a week. I got a business. I got two kids. I got a family. I got a house. They're not going to do it. And he goes, well, what do you want to do? So he goes, I go, well, I need a freaking bike. I need two air tickets to come back for my state title and my national title. I'm not going to miss them. And I need to go, I need to earn at that time, 250 quid a week guaranteed. And I need 30 pound a point and I'll, I'll see what I can do. I called up Brian and I said, here's my manager. Paul told him, he goes, that's okay. Now I got to freaking think about <laughs> my wife. I've been invited to go. I got to go. That's more than Scott gets paid this year. I was say. <laughs> and that was in 83. So, oh man. Okay. Should we end the conversation now? I'm feeling a bit sad. So, so when I, when I got, when I got into England, Brian picked me up at the airport. That was bizarre because driving on the wrong side of the road, that was all very different. And uh, he took me to his family home. Um, I think I stayed, I might have stayed in his family home. I can't remember at the beginning if I lived at his place or if I went straight to Mid 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 Midlow's at Bailey House. Yeah, oh, yeah. One of the two, because um, Midlow was on my team. There's a teammate of mine at pool at the time. But I think I might have been staying with Brian for the six weeks. I think it was, yeah. Anyway, um, Brian gave me a pickup truck because he had a tire store in town, and that was it. He took me to Weymouth to watch racing for the first time. It's the very first time I've seen British Speedway with Weymouth. Um, Wiggy was racing there at that time. Wow. Well, I suppose it's been different because we had, it was team racing over here in the States. It would have been individual, wouldn't it? Absolutely. That was something that I couldn't comprehend at first. You know, I didn't know what it was about until – I started, I was told how it worked, you know, and then I'll say we had to race. So I did six weeks with them and um, went back, back and forth to California twice. So that was three round trips in a matter of six weeks to, to England and back. And so I was broken right in the deep end of the thing. And when I went back to California, man, I had, I had a lot of cash, a lot of cash. Oh, I bet. And I thought this is interesting. And then I got a contract to ride fully for pool in 1984. And do you know what's really quite cool and just something that's only really just popped in my head as we're talking that like you and the rest of the American guys have come over and you've come from an individual sport and it's always been individual in America. Yet, you know, the Americans were always renowned for being like probably the best team rides around, you know, you and Ronnie Corey, Hamlin Hancock, you know, I mean, like Cookie was like one of my heroes as a kid and, you know, the thing I loved about him and so many Americans is how they race as a team, yet you're not used to racing as a team. So that's something that's pretty cool that you guys picked and really honed that in. Yeah, yeah. My answer to that one is really is because of our small tracks, we're very used to riding really close together. Yeah. Fear riding close together. So if we get if we're if we're at a team event, obviously being being as an Americans coming together not knowing anybody else. I mean, there was some cool characters on the, on our squad that I was introduced to, 
Yet I was probably the same age as them, but without the experience. But they were saying, yeah, do this, do that. Bobby was a really good coordinator. And then whenever we'd get on the track, it was natural. Make the start and look out for each other. But we could really ride close together because we knew how to do that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So you've been around a long time in the racing. You must have come across a few riders in your time that have really you off and have really kind of you've not liked racing against them. Who were they? Well, I, I, I've grown to like you now, Scott, though. <laughs> <laughs> and there's me saying you as my hero, hey? Hey, um, you know what? I don't, I don't have a black book, mate, at all. Never, you know, I never... Never dwelled on anything. Never, never. There's only one guy probably that I probably thought was a bit of a twat. Remember Scud from Gradley? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. That guy, he was none as Scud because he'd take you out. Yeah. He's the only guy that I would raise about, he's coming to take me out. That's not, <laughs> yeah. that's not the Scud Scott Smith, is it? Yeah, it is. Not I, the Australian I, one. The, yeah. the one from over here, the British one. Yeah. He wrote for Gradley. The British and, Scud. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he literally would just take you out, and you could just watch him come right at you. And you could—I mean, I was obviously good enough to avoid it, but going, "What, gee, that was it." Oh, yeah, didn't have. He ended up riding for Sheffield. I'm, I'm pretty sure That's in his it. later years. Yeah, he did. He did. Yeah. He did. But did you have a rider then that? Okay, not say you disliked, but that there, there always seems to be a rider that you just seem to be a magnet to for crashes or or confrontation. <laughs> He's talking about poking in the hockey. <laughs> No, 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 no. No, I mean, did you have a rider? Like, I've had a couple over my career that it's not that you dislike them, but you just seem to be magnets and you just always seem to clash with each other. You know what? I, I would um, provoke that to happen and I would just be smarter than him and avoid him and pass him. So, yeah, what, what he's asking, Sam, is who's your Scott Nichols, Chris Harris? <laughs> there, you know what? There, <laughs> There, I tell you what, there isn't because there wasn't. Uh, I, I, I don't have any. I, I knew who my best competitors were. Yeah, yeah. me and Puri Johnson were probably. Puri Johnson was probably the guy that was one that you would know he was good enough to beat you and he was good enough to hurt you. Yeah. So at the level we were at, um, he was a guy that I had to be very smart with all the time. But yet I can go in the dressing room as we do and you're stripped naked and you have nobody to protect you there and you're right next to the shower with them and you can tell them anything you want to tell them right then and there, okay, you're a bit yeah, there, weren't you? Now you're confronting them straight up, aren't you? So I just don't think I had a guy like that that I would go after. Well, that's pretty cool. Oh, that's um, more than what I thought we were going to hear tonight. I, I, Absolutely spellbound by some of those stories, Sam. What, I think we could make about six episodes of this and still not hear it. Yeah, all. We, we, yeah. I mean, we we hit the talent of the talent early. To be fair, I mean, it was uh, we were moving way past that. Wow. So when it comes when it comes down to obviously, whenever I was looking back at my um, when I was putting together some videos and stuff for my farewell meeting, I was um, I was sitting there thinking We've done the about talent it. bit. <laughs> I was thinking to myself that I want to um, I want to put a collage of speed of videos together that was from my from Costa Mesa and all those places, right? When I was looking back at that stuff, I thought to myself at handicap racing, how did I learn how to follow a back wheel, turn the bike, and pass them up the inside? And I used to describe it as axle racing: follow the back wheel. If the guy's going to go wide, you stay behind him because you know if he goes wide, you're cutting in. But if he stays low, you can keep going. So I described it always as axle race sucker. Okay. Doing. That's that was it. So I I learned things that I don't even know how I learned them from handicap racing. Because when I watched those videos from 84, 85, when I was in America racing stuff, the whole season in 85. You know, in 80, 1985, um, I came over for the overseas final the Intercontinental Final, and then the World Final. And I still was the most winningest rider in California. No way. So I kept missing every week or two weeks. But I still, so I thought, fair enough. There was one time, I'm sure it's in the record books. You know, I told you we have handicap racing. Yeah. Match racing, right? I went to every track in the week and won every race. Every race. 
Every and that's race. a stat. That that is a stat. Every it? race, regardless of where you start in the handicap race, everything, every, wow. every main, the whole thing. Wow, and you must have cleaned up. I remember speaking to Bruce Pennell um, on my Instagram things, and he was saying the amount of money he was making three nights a week in the states was incredible. I, I, he was in it when it was really boiling. I mean, there was big crowds. And, and, and I think he fought, his group fought the wars with the promoters and got the percentage from the gate. Yeah. And that percentage of the gate was shared as the prize money for the riders. So if there was 8,000 people in the stadium, you got 20% of the gate split up between the riders. And the best, the, the main events were the ones where they paid the money. So if you won in the main events, I mean, my first year, my racing year in 1985, missing those weeks of racing, I still earned, I think it was 26,000 in prize money and I got 60 grand in sponsorship. I know. And I had to give that up to come over here and race for Wolverhampton. Oh, me up and said, Peter Evans called me up and said, Sam, you know, I can help you win the championship over here, you know? And I said, yep. But I always Sam. How you do <laughs> Wow. So, okay. So we've we've done that, the, the past and the Sam up until then. So before we really go on real quickly to what you're up to now, um, just touching on the speedway aspect, um, how impressed are you with Zmarzlik and, and what he does on a bike and 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 defending his title back to back now? Yeah, I, I I think that that guy's got some talent, obviously. Um I like it because, um, you know, when he was, when he was racing, cutting his teeth at that level, he was known as taking the big risk and throwing the bike in no man's land and coming out of it. He could fold the bike in the corner and do some really cool things. That reminds a little bit of myself. You know, I, I, I actually learned by making mistakes and, and the more times you're at a level like that, you're making sp- mistakes and you're getting away with it the more time you realize, you know what, we're close. I just got to fine tune that and I won't make that mistake. And guess what? I'll be faster. Know your boundaries. So I, I see that in, in his riding ability way early at, when he was doing it, I'm thinking, yeah, this guy's on the gas. But, I mean, he's one of those guys who doesn't really take anybody else out, does he? No, he's like, he's a fair Except ride. in practice. <laughs> yeah. You might have seen something. Yeah, okay. No, I mean, I, I like, I'm super impressed in the way he rides. And the thing is, as well, as you know, Sam, the bikes have changed an awful lot over the years and, and the way the bikes are now. Um, he, he just rings every last ounce of power out of that bike. But what's your take on the weight thing? Because I think, obviously, all sports across the spectrum, weight and fitness is a big issue. But within the Grand Prix Speedway now, I know that there's – probably mental battles more than anything about the weight. People are trying to crash weight off the bikes, off themselves. I mean, some of the boys are borderline ill because they're trying to strip the weight. Do you think it's as big a factor as they're making out, or do you think it's just the typical people following the sheep type scenario? I think probably both. Probably both. Because, because well, obviously, weight rate. Right? I mean, one of the things that we used to joke around in our, in our camp was, you know, the one thing that you don't need a spanner to change in, in the speedway camp is, right? The rider. You can get rid of him anytime you want to, you know? It's just, yeah. I'm in. And the cheapest horsepower is lose weight. You know, so that was it. So if you were in my time, I mean, um, I was, what was I, if we go in pounds, I was 145 to 150 pounds my whole career. Yeah, 10 stone, 68 60, 68 kilos, something like that. Yeah, just, just around 10 stones all the time right there. Over, but 10 and a half, somewhere around there was all the time. And, um, but I never really thought about it as, as it more than when I focused on my eating, I was the discipline of that was for the good for the head more than anything. You know, the training side of things, I was handicapped because I couldn't train a lot the way I wanted to because of my leg. Yeah. It's really, even though I rode till I was 46, my leg is what stopped me from doing it because I couldn't train like I wanted to. So these guys now, um, they are, it is one of those things, as you said, described it as way the sheep, the sheep are going that way, everybody goes that way. It is one of the things that 
I'm sure at this level, we know how hard it is to ride, to be a throttle jockey today. It's down to the bike right now. If it means that they have to focus on their weight to have that frame in their head mentally, that's what it's doing, isn't it? Yeah. Come on, when you train and I train, we're not training because we love it. We train because we're focusing on, we're coming up to the start. We're going to get our elbows out right now. We're on gate four, Hampton, and you're going to do that. Because that's what you're thinking about when you're- There's a goal. Hour on the freaking bike or you're doing something. You're thinking racing all the time. It is, but in my head, I'm not in the Grand Prix and I can see it, but also I think, yes, you be light, but you need to be strong. You need to be strong in your mind as well. And one rider that I have a lot of admiration for, I think probably struggles a little bit because he's quite a tall guy is Jason Doyle. But you look at when he was killing it, when he had those two years where he was unstoppable, he was heavier than he is now. So it's like, is is it all the weight or is it, kind of a bit of both the mental game is, is the mental aspect. Because, you know, in that game, if you're 1% off with your performance, 1% off with your bike, 1% off mentally, then it's game over for you winning that, that Grand Prix. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer with, with, with watching it today that a lot of the riders don't really know a lot about what's going on um, mechanically. They're hunting yeah. the best thing. So they're really working, really working hard to find the recipe out of their engines and the setup as they describe it constantly as a setup. Um, I was just having that conversation the other day with somebody about about that technical stuff in the engine. Throttle control's gone, Sam, from from your days. Well, that's the nature of the beast now, though. That's the way the bike is designed. Yeah, but that that's that's why they they don't need to know about the mechanical side of things because they're not controlling the engine. I speak to Ash Tech a lot, and it's it's just about the engines are built to rev and, and hit the certain point, and they're just built to go flat out, where you yeah. guys back in your day was rolling off, rolling on. It's all about, you know, if you take a scale of 1 to 10, and the, excuse me, the throttle is used from 1 to 10, the guys are only in the 7, 8, 9 right now. They're, they're never, excuse me, they're never below that. Um, and that's just the nature of the beast now. So you, they really do rely on a, a bike that's going to work in that way. The lightness of them, you know what? At the end of the day, that combination, look, there there's 16 guys um, all racing to win the world championship at that level. And then they're the league racing. They're all trying to stay consistent. There's no more peaking anymore. In my day, you'd peak for the world final, right? Grand Prix come in. These guys got to saddle up time and time again to perform. Nobody is that good to win everything all the time. They're expected to win or perform all the time. So in order for them to, to maybe earn their wage, maybe their sponsorship, they have, to, they have to portray themselves as professional athletes right now to generate that. And come on, man, if the way the money and the commercial side of things are right now, you're going to invest into somebody that's working hard, aren't you? If somebody's really working hard and, and they're, they're, they're training and they're doing all their stuff and they're actually producing it on the racetrack, it comes down to the luck after that, you know? Yeah, and there's definitely a lot of emphasis on it, a lot of pressures, especially, like I said, from sponsors, Poland. We all know the pressures are under there, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, Smarzlik did a great job back at his butt up. You know, extremely good. He didn't start off so good, did he, last year? But he ended up finishing the damn thing good. Yeah, that was a lot of character to do that. Um, any, I mean, I've not been fortunate enough to win a world title, but any, whatever t- you win any title, coming in, defend it, the eyes are on you. And and what impressed me is he didn't actually look like he was phased by it, though. His performances wasn't there, but in his body language and stuff, he didn't. But um, well, when I, when I, when as I covered the the European Championship, I watched him, and I can see. Why, what he was doing there. He wasn't bothered if he won or not won. He was there participating, um, you know, and not knowing why he was there or what it took him to be that wild card for that event, whether it was money or I don't know, you right? But he was there. So he was definitely trying to um, practice whatever he was starting out on. Yeah. He didn't dominate nothing. He just went out there and he smiled and he played and he rode a small bike. Cool. Well, we're going to move on real quick. Just before we real quickly move on, as it's a speed freak show, 
Uh, what is Sam doing right now to get his speed freak kick? Okay, I have a I have a perfect world really for that. I mean, I'm I'm you know how it is they say in in the life that whatever you're good at doing, you end up coming back to it. No matter what you do, you can veer off. Um, you know, I've gone and done construction, built houses, done all that stuff. Um, you've seen some of my projects, you know what I'm about. But yeah, it comes down to it. I always seem to land back on the damn thing about engine building and and working on guys' projects. Nothing, nothing seems to since the lockdown. Um, I'm kind of I'm kind of I'm, I'm caged in my workshop right now, and I got some good guys working with me. And we just develop stuff for club level um, racing. And um, as you know, I got a machine shop and I got a dyno and I can, I can, I can actually test bikes and do cool things for people. And, and since I've been locked down, it's worked out in my favor. I've actually started a Facebook page, Sam's Dyno Facebook. And um, we only started it three weeks ago on some of the projects because I got a collage of projects that I've been involved in and built all photographed and one of my buddies come along and said get it out there so we're playing with it right now yeah cool right so then as we are sudden sam is sudden sam ready for the end of the show questions then i don't know that but i'll have a go i mean my throat's really dry right now i think I need right then so, get ready mate get ready <laughs> this is where this is where the action starts so uh two minute warnings on all that train in the race face kicks in now sam so are you ready? Now, this is just a bit of fun. Be as rude as you like. We've got an awesome man who can take all the bad bits out. So, question number one this is a classic snog, marry, avoid, Sam. And your three are Michelle Obama, Hillary Clinton, and Ivana Trump. So, which one are you going to snog? Which one are you going to marry? And which one are you going to avoid? Ivana Trump, I'll marry. Yeah. <laughs> knew it <laughs> I'll, I'll 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 avoid hillary like the plague and i guess i'll snog i'll snog uh michelle, michelle obama, obama. Uh, there we go <laughs> Gee, that wasn't too in. bad was it no <laughs> uh, sam you're an international speedway superstar and you've been on many flights around the world but are you a member of the my high club i i would not like to take the fifth on that and I'll be very honest and say no. <laughs> no. Okay. But in saying that, I've looked at girls thinking, wow. You would like to. <laughs> that doesn't count. <laughs> that doesn't count. Right. Okay. So this one is an acronym. Now it's what does this very common acronym not stand for? So what does BBC not stand for. <laughs> so you're going to make something up. Big boys camp. There you go. Hey. <laughs> there you go. Impressive. Um, question number four. You were um, our first guest, uh, Natalie Quirk's first celebrity crush. So who is Sam Ermolenko's first celebrity crush? Um, definitely that's easily, easily said for me. Celebrity crush is... God, I gotta remember her name now. <laughs> it's real easy. <laughs> no, no, no. I do. I'm just gonna say it right now, but I'm, it's I just lost it. My she, she, oh man, she's a little blonde, and uh, oh man, but she's messed herself up now with Botox and stuff. Pamela Anderson. No, no, oh. no, no. Um, a little blonde. Uh, English or American? American. She played on Sleeping in Seattle. Oh, oh, um. Meg Ryan. Meg Ryan. Meg, Meg Ryan. Boom. Oh, there you go. <laughs> go. Okay. Thanks, guy. We got there in the end. Okay. Right. So then, Sam Amalenko, what's better, sex or winning a race? Sex. Sex. Yeah. yeah. With you on that one. At, at this age, you know, what they say, go on. I've never had the ability to win a race. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say I'd say the thing they used to do all day. It takes me all day to do them now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There's um, tablets for that, Sam. And no, what, I'm talking about racing. Talking, oh, okay. <laughs> whilst we're talking about in bed, Sam, uh, socks in bed or no socks? No socks. No socks. Yeah, that seems to be a popular one. Okay, Sam, this is a, a classy question. 
have you ever weed in the shower? Of course. Of course, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, we do it. I think it's going to be a distinct ladies know men. Yeah, yes. men. Well, yeah. no, wait a minute. I'm talking about freaking out. When I got my flip-flops on and I'm in the shower at some of the crap holes of Speedway showers we've been into, there's the freaking toilet or there's the drain. It's easy. They're both the same, aren't they? Exactly. And like I said before, half the time the water's warmer coming out of you anyway. <laughs> yeah, w- w- wipe the thongs on the way out of some of the showers I've been in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, what are you What are you scared of, Sam? Um, that's a good one. Um, I I have no phobias. Um, where mm, no, I just I'm not. Nah, that's good. I'm not a fan of the dark. I've got to be honest. But anyway, I'm I'm not a fan of indoing. No, because okay. I, I'm right. I'm riding bikes right now, and I I like jumping right now. And I guess that's one thing I got to get mastered. Oh, we're gonna have to get you down here then. Get you down south and take you some trails. Oh, go yeah, go down south, Sam, and have a lonely walk on the beach with Scott Nichols in his lycra. Yeah, whatever. Sunset. <laughs> All righty. So, last question then, Sam. Real simple. Text or call. Um, depends on the situation, but um, if you have to say something that's meaningful, definitely a call. Okay, righty. So, the next bit, Sam is going to be the dodgy dice roulette. So we've got some rude tongue twisters. So there's going to be six of them, obviously, because six sides to a dice. What we're going to do any second, we're going to roll the dice and then we're going to pick out, well, it's going to decide which dodgy tongue twister you've got. So at number one, we've got the pheasant plucker. Number two, we've got puggy wuggy. Number three is fig plucker. Number four is sock cutter. Number five is mother hunt. Number six is Susie sitting. So, let's get ready to roll the dodgy dice. They're off. Is there anyone that you uh, think you do not want to have there, Sam? I didn't even hear anything you said. <laughs> well, it's gonna be, it's gonna be good. I don't know in what context this is gonna go at. So, let's just... <laughs> well, you've got Sam number one, which is the pheasant plucker. So, I'm gonna send it over to you right now on WhatsApp. So if you look at your WhatsApp, Sam, you will have it right there. So if you oh, – and you're not allowed cold. to pre-read it. We're straight in cold. Oh, um, okay. Well, I just got to see if I got something. Okay, there's something – there's two on there, so I'm not going to read nothing yet. Um, yep, all right. Now, what am I looking at? What am I doing? So that message I've just sent you – So I have to put my glasses on. Do I have to read it? Or yes, or what? Oh, there yeah. he is. And it starts with, I am – You've yep. got three attempts to read it out as quick as you can. Three, two, one, go. I'm turned on. I am the pheasant plucker. I am pheasant pluckers mate. I only plucking pheasants because the pheasants plucking late. <laughs> <laughs> You're yeah, not bad, right? Now let's oh, pick plucker, the pace up now. Plucker, yeah, pluckers late. Sorry, I was really trying to concentrate. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's concentrate less and read faster. Let's okay. go. Okay. I am not the pheasant plucker. I am the pleasant <laughs> me. I'm only <laughs> pleasant <laughs> pleasant <laughs> wait. <laughs> I got it. I got it. I got, you got it. it. <laughs> I got it now. Well, oh, well I like think that was plucking marvelous. Oh, that's <laughs> great, Sam. Yeah, yeah, I got it. I tell you what, it took me a minute to get my eyes adjusted. I was- <laughs> well. Do you know, on that note, Sam, thank you very, very much for joining us. It's been awesome having you on and, and hearing the insights. We could have talked forever. Yeah, nice one, man. Yeah, welcome. Um, I'm glad that you enjoyed my little backdrop of my little... Yeah, I thought you were in the in Palm Springs there. <laughs> nice one, guys. Thanks a lot, Sam. Take care and see you soon. Cheers, Sam. See ya. ATPI. Delivering what really matters.